Hello and welcome to this PIR live event webinar brought to you by Partners in Research Canada. My name is Stacey Joyce and I will be your host. Please remember if you're joining us live, you can ask questions anytime throughout the webinar using the chat button in the top left corner of your screen. Make sure that you change the to field in that pop-up window so that it includes all attendees. That way everyone in the audience can see what other classes are asking today. So our guest today is Dr. Audrey Girard. She is an associate professor in the School of Information Technology at Carleton University. She's also the director of the Creative Interactions Lab at Carleton. Thank you so much for joining us. I will let you take it away. Hi, it's really great to join you today. Um, I always like to, to talk about my work because I think it's, it's very exciting. Um, I get excited by it, so hopefully you will too. So, I'm in the School of Information Technology, and so I do um, uh, work that's based in computer science, um, but also sort of brings in a lot of different elements from other fields. So um, that includes some, some design and some psychology because my um, work is in the field of human-computer interaction. So human-computer interaction, which is sometimes referred to as HCI, um, is work that is focused on trying to make the computer easier to use um, for everybody. Um, and that involves um, talking to people, talking to users, that's the most important thing you have to remember if you're gonna build something. Well, you might know how to, um, to build it, but really you should talk to the people who are gonna use it because they are the one who uh, are really important in this equation. Um, I, um, um, I'm, um, I do work in novel technologies, which means that I try to look at um, what can happen in the future. <laughs> what is going to come on our shelves, in our pockets, um, in terms of smartphones, for example, in five to ten years. And so I've been looking at the idea of deformable devices. That is, for example, a flexible smartphone. So we're going to have some flexible displays. Um, those are actually sort of already starting um, to, uh, to happen. Um, but beyond the fact that it curves and that's nice, so it's going to be more comfortable in our back pockets, what can the fact that it's flexible actually bring us? Um, we think that by bending the corner of your phone, this could mean that you're going to um, be able to change the pages in the book that you're reading, change the volume of your um, of your music player, or change the um, or change the or answer the phone call, for example. So I'm going to um, show you a couple of videos. Um, of the work that um, that my team and I are doing. Of course, it's not all of our work and you can see more of it on our YouTube channel if you want to, but I'm going to um, share my screen onto um, the uh, presentation that I have so that you can see uh, my videos. Um, screen. I'm going to pick um, on this one, but I actually have to go back to the first line. Sorry, there you go, I have a little preview. So um, this is just a kind of a fun uh, beginning, my phone can bend. Um, so this is um, a flexible bezel that we have around a regular smartphone. Um, and so it's made out of silicone. And in the back, there are some bend sensors, which can detect well, when you bend it. Um, so we have some in every corner so we can detect when we're bending each corner, whether we're bending it up or down or a little bit or a lot. And we build this little game. Um, it's uh, called Paper Ninja. That um, basically the way you're, you're folding the phone makes um, the little piece of paper um, folded um, the same way. So we tried this to see um, how people like it, if it's comfortable. These are the type of questions that, that we ask. But the main thing that I want to present today um, is a game controller that we've, um, that we've built. So um, this uh, game controller is called Bentroller, and it's similar to kind of a regular um, controller. Well, it's, let's say, a retro controller. Um, 
where it was kind of squared and, and rigid and had buttons. Um, now we cut it in half and put a flexible bridge in, in the middle made out of um, a foam. And I'm going to show what you can um, do with it. So here we can bend up and we can bend down and we can twist left and we can twist right with this um, game controller. We can still use the buttons and they all work, uh, but you can do more and you can do um, things that might be more natural. So um, what we did is plugged it into a few different games. So here we have Donkey Kong and punch out and you can see that you're twisting to, um, to punch the opponent and we have Tetris um, and Tetris we can twist to actually change um, how the, uh, the piece and we have a 3D racer game um, and then we tested um, turning left and right with our bending and twisting and um, and uh, accelerating. So this is really exciting. Um, I have it here too. Um, so these pieces on the left and the right, the rigid ones, um, they are 3D printed. That's really fun. You make a, a model and you send it to the printer instead of having some piece of paper, you have this really cool um, case. And it's actually two pieces, sort of a top and a bottom one. You can see a little sliver here, um, you can see it here too. Um, and then we put some, some buttons and some wires um, inside to connect them. And inside I have two, um, here we go. You can kind of see my little bend sensors here. The, there's two of them and then they can detect if one is, if they're bending, then I know it's uh, going down. And if I do it this way, one is up and one is down. So I know that it's twisting. And so to create this really interesting um, controller, uh, you need really different um, interesting pieces, interesting skills. So yes, you have to build it. So there's some hardware skills required to put the buttons together and um, solder them or, or plug them together. So that's actually pretty, um, that's easier to do than, than you might think. Um, there's a lot of kits out there that, that you can put this together. And this is really fairly simple. There's um, six button and two sensors. But then you have to um, do a little bit of code because you have to receive all this information from these six uh, buttons and two band sensors and try to determine what's pushed. So there's going to be um, a different um, a signal whether to identify each button. And so you can know which one is, is, uh, is pushed and, and, and calculate um, going up and down in the band sensors. And, and then you have to plug that into uh, a software application. You have to actually make it work with a game. So you can design a game. Um, and that's a lot of fun. And I've had some students uh, design a game. Um, I don't have a video for it, but I really um, should, should record my students uh, playing. I have one game that works with Ben Troller and it's a little mouse with a jetpack that goes up and down when you, um, you bend the controller um, and it's trying to eat a lot of cheese. Um, and so that really requires a lot of creativity. And I think that's what's really fun about programming is the ability to enable you to do anything. It can do sort of just basic math um, and calculating stuff with like spreadsheets and complicated sort of income taxes that are pretty boring, I find, um, but pretty useful. But you can take it all the way from that to actually making really creative applications that can help you um, or can that, that can be kind of fun um, fun things um, that you can play with or that can be helpful for you. Um, and so it's, it's really, it's really a lot of fun. Um, and, and it's very interesting and creative. And that's what I think some people might not know about, um, about programming, but I think it's, it's what I find most, uh, uh, most interesting about my work is trying to sort of come up with good ideas and then we build them and we ask people what they think about them. So there you go. That's quite the succinct overview. Thank you so much. It must be difficult. I, th I bet you've tried a lot to explain what it is that you do in your lab that now you have this, uh, this ability to tell us in, in short order what it is that you do. Yeah, I've, I've told this story a couple times, but it's <laughs> what's fun about it.
Awesome. So you, you obviously do a lot of different things in your lab. And uh, just a quick reminder to the audience that please uh, do send in more questions anytime now as you have them. We're going to start into the Q&A now. But um, I guess the first question I have is, um, what types of different people do you collaborate with for this? Because it sounds very interdisciplinary, lots of different things coming together, different skills. That's what's really interesting about human-computer interaction is that it is very interdisciplinary. My students, I've got um, eight students uh, that work in my lab at the moment, really come from different backgrounds. Some are more um, technology-oriented with uh, programming um, or engineering or computer science backgrounds. Some come from um, interactive multimedia and design, meaning that this is a bit technical, but it's a program that's also very creative. Um, they know how to do games and modeling and animations and web design. Um, I've had students that came from industrial design. I've got some that come from architecture. Um, it's, it's pretty varied um, because there's so many different components that come into it. I also have students that come, I have a student that is from sociology and anthropology background. So her technical skills are fairly limited, but she has a really interesting view on the work we do because, because we have to create these things, we also have to ask the question, will people be willing to use them and use them in public, for example? If you have to do this crazy sort of odd gesture to connect to your phone, you might not want to do that in a public bus, for example. So that's an um, interesting question, sort of the social acceptability of, of things. So yeah, I collaborate with all sorts of different people because that's, I get the best out of everyone um, and, and really build on everybody's expertise. Wonderful. Now we have a question from the grade fours at Winona Elementary in Hamilton, Ontario, wondering if you have any way to show them how the 3D printer works. They've never seen a 3D printer in action. Oh, I would love to, but it'll have to be at another time. I'm currently just in my, my office and all I have is computers and a couple books. Um, I don't have the 3D printer here. Um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, so and we actually got our 3D printer, our 3D printer in my lab last week, two weeks ago. Um, this one was at the university library. And that's what's really nice about it. I don't know if in your neighborhood you have that, but I know more and more public libraries or maker spaces in various different cities have these um, tools. And, and, and really with a little training or with the help of the, the technician that there, um, you can actually try it out yourself. I know that's true here in, in Ottawa. Um, and so that might be sort of a resource um, worth, worth checking out. Wonderful. And uh, I think if you're just looking for uh, a video to just quickly see that today, you might be able to find some things on YouTube after the webinar here. Um, but our next question is from Rolf Road Public School. And Ryan there is wondering, um, do you think what you're making will ever be used in a game console? Oh, I, I hope so. I don't know if, if it will be. Some of our work is, is sort of we try it in the lab and it would need adoption from um, sort of a manufacturer. And, and that's, a lot, that's a lot of work that's very different from what I do. I basically have ideas and test them out. I don't actually often make it onto um, production, but um, I wish um, that we could. Um, in the meantime, you're gonna have to come down to, to to Carleton uh, University and, and be one of our test participants if you want to play with it. I think you might have some volunteers. Several of our classes today are from the, the Ottawa area. So oh, you, might, you might be fielding some emails. Um, and next we have a question from Ms. King's class uh, asking what gave you the idea to make bending devices? That's a great idea. So um, I used to do completely different research. I used uh, brain signals to connect to the computer before, and that was interesting. Um, and then I kind of uh, was finishing my studies and I was looking for um, sort of another research opportunities. And I came across this really interesting lab at uh, Queen's University at the time. And they were doing some research with flexible displays. They had one of the very first ones in sort of a research lab outside of people who build them. And so we put together um, paper phone, which was the first flexible um, smartphone prototype. 
And that was actually really interesting. And so after that, I moved on to my current job. Um, but I thought that bendable devices and flexible displays were really interesting and something that people haven't looked at. And that's really one of the criteria that, that you're looking for when you're doing research is you want to be the first at doing something. Um, you want to try to imagine what the world can be in five, 10, 20 years. And that was fun to me. And so that's why I've been doing ever since because I still find it interesting. Wonderful. Um, the grade sixes and sevens at Maple Ridge are wondering how long it took you to make the bendable controller. So it was my uh, master's student uh, Peyton that, that put this together. It, it took some time because there's a lot of um, design work and conceptual sort of you, you draw it on paper and then you try it out with um, proto you, you do kind of paper prototyping. In this case, it was foam prototyping. So instead of uh, having this rigid part and this flexible foam part, well, he actually built everything out of foam so that we could test different sizes that were, there was first version was smaller and then this bigger one and to test like the thickness and you wanted to be comfortable and then placement of button. So that was the first step. And then he tried to 3D print it. And this is a really nice 3D print. We had some not so nice ones in the meantime, again, it's a prototype, so you, you iterate, you do multiple versions. So it took a, a couple of months. Now, now that we know how to build it, um, we can build it in a day or two. Um, that's, that's a lot easier. Um, but by sort of the time we thought about it and we actually have a good version, it, yeah, it took a little while. Things, things are slow sometimes. Right. And that sounds like just the way that you would prototype anything. You, you make one and you see what works and doesn't work and then you make a better one and you test that out. And so do you have any idea how many versions of Ben Troller you went through? Hmm. I'd say we probably had four or five that were just in foam and we probably had a dozen of these, uh, of these, in various capacities of, of these uh, more final versions. Um, and my students still have a lot of ideas of, of what the next version should be to make it more comfortable, to make it more sturdy because these things break. Unfortunately, it's a prototype and our soldering skills are not perfect. Um, and the sensors are not perfect. And so, um, yeah, we have a couple of days of, of how to improve it. So these, these things, it's a constant evolution. Well, it's interesting that you say that because the next question I wanted to ask you is from Addie at Rolf Road, um, asking what happens if you drop the device due to sensors break? And related to that, the students in Ms. Hurst's class just want to know a little bit more about those bendable sensors and did you design and make them? So it, are they very breakable and, and how do they work? So the bend sensors themselves um, are if you drop them on the floor they're not going to break um, same thing with with this you might end up chipping the end but that's not really what the issue it's more like repetitive motion that ends up um, loosening them up so i have another prototype um, that where you can see the bend sensors a little bit more so this is more like what a flexible smartphone would be of course i don't have a display on this but it might um, and this one you can bend uh, kind of the corners here um, but I've, uh, so it's basically two pieces of um, silicone. Um, we actually 3D printed the mold, so back to 3D printing. We poured some silicone into it, we let it um, dry, and then we have these two pieces that are held together with, um, with screws. But what's nice is I can open it and you can see what's inside. So this part is the bend sensor, I have two. Um, and then I have sort of a blue cap, but under there, there are the wires that connect the sensors to, you can see I have wires under there. And it's really at that intersection that things can break because this part is flexible, that's okay. Um, this part is not, and then the wires are obviously flexible, but it's at the intersection where this part needs to be rigid that sometimes it breaks because we bend it too much. Um, and those sensors are sensors that uh, we bought. We didn't make them. Um, there are ways to making them, but we usually use just commercial ones. Um, these are a company called FlexPoint, but you can get um, other types of, of similar bend sensors on, um, on many 
um, sort of pr uh, electronics um, shops. Um, they're all slightly different, but they all work very well. And so they detect, oh, see, I, I, I unlocked it. Um, so that, that's the issue. But I can now show you a little bit more of, um, um, I've got sort of, it's bending one way and it's bending the other way and I get um, a, a different values depending on how it bends. Right. Um, so back to more of the coding aspect of what you do. Uh, Mr. Yee's class is wondering if you use binary code to program the controller. No, nobody programs. You cannot program in binary. Um, so the way coding works is um, binary, so ones and zeros, is what the computer understands. Um, and so that's um, what we need to eventually give to the computer. However, humans can't code in binary. Um, I, I teach programming and, and we can barely get to sort of converting the number 187 into binary and that's about as far as, as we go. It's really too complicated for, for human brains to, to deal with. So what we do is we code in um, languages that we can understand, that have a little bit of, of uh, um, English in, in it. And so we can code um, in, so we've coded uh, an Arduino, which is a type of C, C++ coding. We've coded in processing, which is a type of Java. Um, and there's a lot of different types of, of programming, sort of Python and Perl. And um, those are all different programming that end up being converted with a program called a compiler into binary. And so humans don't code in binary directly. We kind of use a proxy to translate what we say um, into code that the computer can understand. That makes sense because that whole binary thing sounds really complicated when you think about all the ones and zeros you have to go through just to say, as you said, the number 187 to represent that is a lot. So you can imagine all the actions that you want uh, the computer to do that would be quite lengthy and complicated. Yeah. Which brings me to a question from Ms. King's class, wondering how long did it take your team to code uh, the Ben Troller, the games that you used the Ben Troller for? So my, the, the videos that you saw, the, um, the games, we did not create them for um, this specific purpose. Um, we connected it um, to arcade games that exist already, like Donkey Kong and Tetris. Um, and then the second game, the 3D racing game, was a game that that student had created the year before for a school project, um, a very extensive school project, let's be honest, but a school project. So it was easy to just essentially kind of plug in our uh, new types of inputs from, from the, our game controller onto that game. Um, the game that, um, the one with the mouse um, that I was um, describing earlier, is one that a student created this summer. So it took him about two months um, to write um, in between doing other tasks. Um, and he used Unity to, um, to code um, this. Um, Unity has a, a so C sharp, so it's another type of, of C programming. Um, and so he, he did it with that um, and it took him that. And then sort of games take anywhere from a weekend to create in really cool events called game jams to you know, years and hundreds of people working on it in big game studios. So it all depends on, on the type of game that you end up, you want to end up with. Right. And you've mentioned several different platforms that you've used for coding. Uh, so we had a question from Kevin at St. Joe about uh, particular programs. So Kevin, I hope we've answered your question, but let us know if not, and we'll, we'll circle back around to that. Um, we do have an interesting question from Ms. King's class about um, how they have done some things in class with design thinking and wondering um, what kind of design thinking process do you use or what does that look like in your work? Oh, that's a really good question. I'm glad you guys are, are, are doing that in class. So design thinking um, is, is, has a, a few different components, but it's about uh, thinking about sort of the whole project and what your um, users might want to um, might want to to use in the end. What is there already, um, and making sure that you really go step by step and make sure that you um, sort of think and evaluate things as as you go. Um, and so in this case. Um, 
we had more of an idea and 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 built it and then sort of tested it with users which is not usually sort of how we go around it um, but because we have knowledge of how um, uh, sort of bend uh, actions go and then we had some expertise in terms of gaming um, we really were trying to um, we were trying to think about that and and go with um, sort of our, our skills level, but as soon as we could, we started testing in terms of, of how comfortable the gestures were with different people around us. Um, and then definitely sort of the games we asked our participants, uh, we asked about 20 participants for each game um, to, to test our, our prototype and, and tell us if it was comfortable, if it was, if it was um, interesting to use and stimulating and then we looked at also whether it was fast or not um, and so that's really important um, when you're you're building something is to make sure that you you're, you're tested so that's a little uh, one component of, of design thinking wonderful now another question that surprised me and i think is a great question i want to make sure we get to from mr yee's class uh, have you ever tried something and have it just not work out and what happened and why Yes, um, that's a great question. I really like it. It's really interesting because that's what research is. We put stuff together, sometimes it works and sometimes our, um, our users say, hey, maybe, maybe not. Um, it's, it's not exactly not working out, but I'll just um, continue with, with the Ben Troller example. What we found is that it's not fast um, when you're comparing um, pressing a button, so I can press a button five times really quickly, one, two, three, four, five. Um, doing this five times takes longer, right? I'm, I have so complete sentences by the time I finish five. So if you're comparing um, how fast buttons are versus bends are, buttons are going to win, in which case my prototype is not faster. And so if that's the criteria I use to determine if it's better, then I'm going to throw it in the garbage because it's not good. But um, that's where sort of looking at different things, different aspect of a product or an interaction um, is important because it's not fast. It's very clear. My data was really not even close, but it's really stimulating. It's really novel and it's kind of more natural gestures because it's closer to um, what their games require. I'm just gonna use the example of, of punching. If I do this, it's kind of a similar um, gesture to, to, um, to boxing. And so it matches really well with that game. And that's really interesting and that's a success. And it's more similar than just pressing a button. There's, there's nothing really to boxing to, to just pressing a button. So that's where um, sometimes our success and our failures are all about how we look at them and they're always a learning experience because we iterate and that's where some of our, some of our earlier prototypes fail um, but we figure out why and then we make better prototypes. Wonderful. Now we are running out of time here but I do, um, I do want to ask you um, if you have any advice for, for students who are maybe starting out this week with coding, um, if they wanted to dive into one of the coding languages or programs that you used, which one would you recommend? And if they wanted to pursue this more long term, if they thought this sounded really neat and they wanted to maybe pursue a career in a similar area, maybe a, some short term advice and long term advice for those students. Coding is great and it's useful and it's something that everybody can do. There's no doubt in my mind about this. Um, there are different applications. Find something that you find interesting, that makes you passionate. If it's games, do games. If it's um, a, 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 an application that does some art automatically, then do that. Pick something that will make um, you interested in this. There's a lot of different resources um, to start. I think Scratch, if you're really starting out, is a great, um, a great tool, a great language. It's something that you can do um, just from any computer because it's, it's online. Um, 
And you can do a lot with Scratch. You can do really fun applications. I use it in my intro to, um, to programming class at the very beginning, just to get a taste uh, for, uh, for people. Processing is actually also pretty um, sort of a, easy to access. Um, if you know a little bit about programming, um, sort of if you're feeling comfortable with Scratch, you can do some, some, some work with processing because you can do a lot with that too. Um, and then just sort of try it out. Um, if you don't like what you're currently doing, find another example, make something else work. Um, it's useful for people that are in any, um, in any skills and in any um, jobs, because if you know how programming works, it's going to make you better at um, like even using um, your programs. And so that's, that's really great. And I think sort of for um, in school, it's, it's uh, very important to, to not be afraid, just dive in, doesn't work, that's fine. When it's going to work, you're going to have this jolt, jolt of excitement. Um, I, every time I write a program, I'm going to have some, some errors and then I fix them and then it's really exciting because now um, my, uh, what game did I do? I did a little, um, I forget the, the name of it sort of, it's just really exciting when you have something really um, um, that works well um, and, and, and you just do it and everybody makes mistakes. That's, that's normal, that's fine. I love that part about coding. I've done a, just a little bit of introductory coding like many of our students who are watching. And I love the fact that when it doesn't work, you just go back, you figure out why, you fix it. And it's true. The simplest of games, you really do get this little high after you make it that you feel so wonderful that it works and all of that effort that you put in um, makes something in the end that functions. So I'm going to leave our students on that as they set out this week to explore computer science. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Gerard, and answering our questions. My pleasure. And just to let the audience know, we've got more coding webinars this week. And uh, next week, we're kind of moving this to an application with a webinar about autonomous vehicles. Uh, also researchers from Carleton University. So you can find out more information about this and other educational programs at pirweb.org. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone, and happy Computer Science Education Week.